And good morning. It is time for the Mike Hewitt Show. Brought to you by RenegadeRiver.com. And now here's your host, all ready to go, Mike Hewitt. Good morning, Mike. Hey, good morning, Brian Thomas. Good morning, Ludwig von Wiedendorski here in the studio. And our co-host, Miles Bauer from the great state of Illinois, on the line with us. Folks, we've also got on the line with us this morning, Daniel Horowitz, who is the senior editor of Conservative Review, a writer, a policy analyst, and man... Dan, you've been everywhere. You do a lot of writing. I'm telling you, and, and there's so much more <laughs> in my thought processes I can't get on paper. It has been probably one of the busiest news cycles that I could uh, I could even remember between the courts and the legislation and national security and immigration and Benghazi. And my gosh, it's everything's just coming down at once, but... Uh, <laughs> We're, we're all on it at conservativereview.com. Yeah, it's it's just by, and by the way, I I, I folks, uh, I, I don't before we're done today, I'll have you let folks know how to get on your email list, because the things that I get from you are are uh, pretty incredible. I appreciate getting them. Listen, you've not been on since December, and the world feels like it's changed dramatically since then. Um, and and looking at all the topics you write on, I was a little bit. There were so many, I thought, I can't fit them all into a segment. But what I'm hoping to do with you this morning is have you maybe give us a little bit of your view on the current state of conservatism. I say that because I believe it's in a state of change or a state of flux. So what's what say you, Daniel? You know, where conservatism is right now is where a defeated army is, and it's nowhere. What, what, what you've had pretty much starting in the Obama presidency, a little bit before then, this modern era of the Democrat Party, they realized that going back to the 70s, 80s, there was kind of a detente between the two parties. Um, you know, Democrats would push to a certain extent, but there's only a certain amount they believe that they could fundamentally transform the country, grow government. And likewise, Republicans, there was only a certain amount that they could slow the growth of government, they could really, they, they always understood they could never really, um, you know, roll, roll it back. Now, it was, it was never fully balanced. The Democrats always won. It was more of a 60-40 proposition. But there was a certain detente. At some point, Democrats realized, hey, there's nothing behind that drywall. Right. We could just push it down, and there is nothing to stop us. And what Obama recognized and, and what he's been doing just just since we spoke last, and certainly throughout the tenure of his presidency, is winning 50-year culture battles overnight without firing a shot. I, I keep asking some of my colleagues, what do the Democrats need to do to elicit a righteous, united response from our side? I mean, as we, as we talk, they are mandating transgenderism in the, in the military. Right. Um, they are putting our soldiers into a meat grinder with insane rules of engagement, but not pulling out. So, in other words, they're they're keeping their our special ops in Afghanistan, upping their missions, but um, clamping down with uh, with rules of engagement that are getting them killed. Um, they are shoving women in inv- infantry at all costs against the wills of the Marine commanders. There's just an article out that they've literally renamed 19 job descriptions that had the, the, the word man in it, um, a gunnery man or whatever, and, and changing it. This is our Marines. Um, you know, like I said, the codifying transgenderism, where there was just one party in one state, North Carolina, willing to stand up against this and say, well, uh, you know, man's a man, woman's a woman. You, you know, next week we're going to celebrate July 4th, and I'm, you know, I'll direct your listeners to Conservative Review. I'm going to have a manifesto out. I, I do this kind of every year. It's become my um, my tradition. And, and last year's July 4th manifesto inspired my book coming out July 19th, Stolen Sovereignty, which is really about this social transformation without representation. Right. And what you're seeing is you're seeing all this social transformation, the, the Islamic immigration, the, 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 you know, the Syrian refugees pouring in one to 300 a day. And by, uh, by the way, Michigan has gotten the most per capita of any state so far um, this year, I, I think dating back a couple of years as well. Whoever voted for this? But th- that's the point. This is what happens when there is no legitimate vehicle 
promoting conservatism. But but the so thing, the, but the problem. Sure. Let, me, let me just stop you for a second. Two things occur to me. Well, actually, three. So let me just run through them real, real briefly. The first is is that listen, I I am thoroughly convinced that this is the epitome of slow drip over a long period, like a century plus period. And in fact, I would I would put forward that this is the result of politics being advanced post Civil War forward. But but what gets me about it is two things. First off, when when the progressive side of this issue, when we negotiate with them and we reach a resolution, conservatives have a tendency of wiping their hands and say, "Okay, we got that one resolved now." Whereas the progressives don't. They immediately begin the next push. So there's there's not even a pause, not even like a day. So we arrive at whatever our conclusive our negotiation is. And, and by the way, if we win, they don't stop. And if we lose, they don't stop. They're the epitome of the ever-ready bunny. And so I, I'm trying to push back on that is a challenge, especially when you have, you know, in my daily life, that would be my third thought, and I'll marry them and let you take it from there. But in my daily life, the people that I meet, even the Democrats, by the way, they live a conservative life. Most of them do. If you watch how they're raising their children, I'm talking about married couples in the state of Michigan that I do business with. And they're they're literally, they're living a conservative life, but they're espousing something that they themselves don't live. Nobody says, jeepers, I wish my daughter would grow up to be a man. That's just not, that's just not a reality. I get the political correctness of acknowledging it, but no one's encouraging it, hoping for it. And so you go, why would they want to have a society that that not only just accepts it but advances and promotes and campaigns for it. So tell me why what's the connector? What do they get out of this flipping of our society upside down? Well, you know, that's a real trenchant point. And that's a point I make very often when you look at the imbalance between our political class and our society. On the political level, you're right. Yes, the country has been transformed. Some of it's um you know, the decline of religions, except for Islam. <laughs> some of it's uh, the social transformation of our immigration the last generation or two. Um, some of it's the family structure that's changed. I mean, the, the amount of kids that are born out of wedlock, the decline of married families. But, you know, even with the existing demographics, it's not as radical as the governing class. And when I say the governing class, I don't just mean the politicians, but I mean academia, the media. Hollywood and now the cor- corporations that are in on this, certainly when you're talking about this transgender stuff, <clears throat> you know, where, how do you have this? But again, when you don't have men on the field, right. you don't have another side to push back and define the narrative. You know, but, but listen, by you, default, but, the other side defines it. Daniel, I, hey, I, Mike? I can't, you'll go ahead, Miles. Yeah. Um, Daniel, uh, pleasure speaking with you today. Um, I have a question though, that I'd like to hear your re- response on. Um, remember back in 2008, if you opposed Obama's policies, you were um, characterized in the media as a racist, and they're starting to say if you push back on Hillary, you're a misogynist. Isn't some of this leading to the suppression of political speech and that perhaps, as they were talking about during the Brexit vote, that we are looking at suppressed speech, but people are still thinking in the ways that we all believe they are. They They just may not be expressing it by virtue of the ridicule that they may receive. You know, Miles, yeah, great great to talk with you. I think that's actually the rationale behind the result that I'm talking about, the result of why you have this imbalance. We don't have men on the field pushing back. You have one side defining the contours of political discourse. Everything in politics is a binary choice. Now, it shouldn't be. Life is more complicated than that. But it, are, are you pro or con this, pro or con that? Um, are, are you for or against allowing um, terrorists to buy guns? <laughs> you know, so either you define it or you get defined by it. You become a victim of the narrative. And Democrats always win and define it. Now, why? I think you, you really um, you know, gave a solution to that because the Democrats have learned how to pick our lock. They just shout racism, bigotry, whatever name accusing the, their opponent of being hateful um, in a crowded theater, and our guys just run for that exit, and there's chaos. And, and, and that's how they suppress it. So that's how we have a one-sided argument. That's why I say they're not winning 
culture war battles. They're winning them. They come in with their forces and win without firing a shot because there's nobody there. You know, and this is what I do, and I find very few allies, some bedrock things. I wrote an article, it is immoral to draft women. I think it's very simple to play towards the common sense of people, and I think that is a view that deep down most people share. You know, if people certainly want to volunteer for, for, for the military, if women want to volunteer, they volunteer. Um, you know, there was a debate over women in, in, in infantry. But we've gone – They've jumped 10 steps to now mandating it, sure. that no, every woman has to do it. I mean, wait a minute. There's no societal notion that you know, men are here to protect women, and, and even if you want to kind of change that, but to, to mandate it for all women, I, again, and that men are women and a guy with a penis – is really a woman? Nobody thinks like that. Nobody obsesses with this stuff. Right, but um, but but Daniel, to Miles's point, in what I believe he described as fascism, it isn't it isn't liberalism in the classical sense, most certainly. But when I when you look at advancing policy by force, and squelching your opponents with with their fear of you, that's by definition fascism. Um, if I don't like what you're saying, I'll take your books out in a parking lot. And I'll make sure you never talk. That's fascism to think that way. But what I find fascinating, frankly, is that there's even conservatives left to to have these kind of dialogues. And I say that because we've had a steady at every point in our culture for at least the last from post World War II forward, an uh, um, absolute avalanche of of uh, a socialistic policy, uh, progressive uh, societal um, invention. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about elementary school, um, high school, all the way through, especially through higher education. You're educated. Miles Bowers, a master's degree. Uh, uh, Matt Weednoff sitting here as a man. Everyone around, all the people around me have went through the indoctrination process. When we watch even things like the Beverly Hillbillies back in the old days, of course, back then I laughed. Now when I go back and watch an episode, I'm just stunned with the amount of uber-left politics that I didn't realize I was watching. And so I'm saying it's a conservatism must be really strong to think that we still exist in spite of everything that they've thrown at us. So maybe I'm being naive, but I'm I'm thinking Miles is on the right path to say that the post-World War II political structures and maybe even I'll, I'll add the ideology definitions are shifting again. And so, and, and by the way, well, let me not leave that that thought. What is your opinion of the Trump candidacy? Well, so you know, just before Trump, I, I think you're right that it is something to celebrate that at least there are some conservatives left. What's going on now, to a certain extent, you're, you're saying, how is it that people live such conservative lives, but they're able to get away with what they're doing? I think that's the point. It's, it's been a hundred year process since the era of the progressives, but it's like the frog in the boiling water. You, you increase the temperature very gradually, and people don't realize it. What the left has been doing the last eight or so years, they've just turned up the stove really high. Right. So I think enough people are getting it. The problem is that through the course of this 100-year journey, the right as a political movement has been so co-opted, corrupted, feckless, bankrupt that there's – no vehicle to reap the windfall of the awakening. Part of it, so part of it, though, part of part of it, though, at least in my belief, is that we've really been raised to believe, uh, first off, that these things that we accept as normal are normal. So why would you argue over something that's normal? That's part of it. And the other part is we've been raised to believe things like that can't happen in America. And I use what I often use as an example. Did a polling for a, a state house race in the state of Michigan. Uh, all of the issues of the top five issues of the time when this particular poll was done, the constituency of that state representative overwhelmingly disagreed with her. And yet then they went and voted for her in the 75% range. And what a monstrous disconnect that is between how the people are living and what they're voting for. It's like they put blinders on and go in and vote for the exact opposite of what it is that they're saying they support. So even on even on the Republican side, a good third of them are what I would identify as Democrat, at least in ideology. <laughs> and yet their constituency, well, wow, she or he is wonderful. Hey, I remember uh, listening to Andrea Tanteros on uh, 
I think it was a show on um, Sunday night on the radio, and she was talking about exactly what you were saying, Dan, with people being tired of being called a racist and the pushback, that white males are overwhelmingly in for Trump because he's finally the voice saying, we're not that, we're tired of being called that, and we're going forward. What do you think about that? You think that's she's on a good point there? No, there's no question about it. There's always a pendulum swing. There's always a rubber band effect in politics. And at some at some point, we're going to reach peak political correctness. You know, the left always talks about peak oil or peak thistles. You know, peak political correctness is like any asset bubble that's overpriced, and it's gonna it's gonna bust at some point. And I think that's where we've we've reached because they turned up the heat so high, people can't handle it anymore. They're sick of it. Political correctness started out as kind of a cute gesture. Then it became obnoxious. Um, then it became insane. And now it's downright dangerous po- and destructive, politi- especially poli- as it relates, relates to Islamic terror. Dan, let me insert for a second. <laughs> political correctness started out as a term from the Soviet Union, and it was designed to dictate to folks what was politically correct to the party. And folks, it hasn't changed a bit. It's still that ugly. That's what political correctness is. To me, not pushing back on you, Dan, but to me, political correctness has never been cute. It has always been an advent of the Soviet Union, and I see it as one of the mechanisms that are using to destroy our Union of States. Oh, exactly. No, but, 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 it, but I think to, to Dan, Dan's point. Well, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Miles. No, I was going to say, but I think to Dan, Dan's point, he, he's uh, correct in that political correctness was one of the things that gradually turned up the heat on the stove. For the frogs, um, certainly. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. No, and and I agree with your other point, Dan. I, I was going going to bring bring it up. Do you believe that because you know because of the ebb and flow of history, do you believe we have reached that point where the pendulum has swung so far to the left that now it's going to begin um, you know the journey back towards the right? So I I think we're already seeing that to a certain extent, but there are two challenges we have. Number one is there, the, our society has been completely transformed. So it's not like any other time in history. Put it this way. If you had 1984 demographics in the current um, political climate, Hillary Clinton would not be able to win a single state. I mean, that, that, that's obvious. Right. Uh, but Barack Obama won um, fewer counties than Michael Dukakis did, and Dukakis got crushed, and, and Obama, at least in 2012, won pretty handily, sure. pretty Listen, decisively. Hey, Dan, then, Dan, I've got to stop you. We've got to go to a break, but I want to have you do me a favor. I know we talked about one segment, but can I hold you over for another because there's way too much on the table for you. Too much to talk about. <laughs> yeah, you betcha. So, folks, we're going to go to a break, and we'll be back with Daniel Horowitz after these messages. You're listening to The Mike Hewitt Show. RenegadeRiver.com is new and used firearms, all priced to sell, plus ammo, reloading supplies, optics, clothing, lasers, and yes, tactical gear. RenegadeRiver.com, family owned right here in Michigan, because you deserve it. This is News Talk 1090, WKEZ, and Talk 1230, WTKG. And this is the Mike Hewitt Show, of course. Brought to you by RenegadeRiver.com. And back into it with segment number two and your host, Mike Hewitt. Hey, welcome back, West Michigan. Listen, we've got on the line with us Daniel Horowitz, who is the senior editor of Conservative Review and just a prolific writer extraordinaire. He's been seen and heard on TV and radio, and we're very fortunate to have him with us this morning. Also with me, if you're just tuning in, Ludwig von Wiedendorski is in charge of the streaming system. <laughs> and if you folks have a way of getting the audio to work better on the streaming iPad, please shoot me an email. And then also with us is Miles Bauer, our, our co-host from the great state of Illinois. Listen, off the, during the break, we were talking about does conservatism, conservatism have a mechanism or a vehicle to deliver itself to policy? And I I think that's a good way for me to summarize it. So, uh, Daniel, if you would take us from where we were at break and and share some some of your thoughts with the people. Sure. So, you know, what I wanted to say is, A, we have the demographic problem that, you know, even to the extent that we change some hearts and minds, there is a growing floor of individuals that are just completely impervious. 
Um, and, and that's what you know our founders and I warned about this. By the way, my book um, Amazon is shipping it, even though it's before the release. Stolen sovereignty. I have several chapters on immigration, our history, what our founders and early political leaders thought about it. I'm comparing just the numbers and trends to even the great wave. We've never done what we did the, this past generation. So you can only go so long just importing the third world in such mass numbers and it not having a permanent effect, no matter what um, the body politic is, is a uh, you know, where the pendulum is in the body politic at any given time. And surely, so that, I do think surely that's the reason for wanting to do that, a, a to shift the demographic um, to the point where it can never be taken back. And then and then I think the other half of that equation is that some of those folks at the top of the pyramid genuinely are embracing global globalism, which is about as opposite of my politics as a person can be. No, exactly, and that's the opposite of sovereignty. And you see, and I think particularly issues related to sovereignty, as you're seeing here, um, at least in the perceived um, views of Trump, and in in Great Britain, you know, with the Brexit vote, that is resonating. And that's why I wrote my book, Stolen Sovereignty. So I think that is an issue we could harness. But the the second problem is we need a political vehicle to represent us. Part of the problem we've had is that we've become a victim of our own success. No Republican or almost no Republican runs as a Rockefeller Republican anymore. Right. They're all conservatives. They're all Tea Party guys. But the problem is almost none of them are. Right. So, you know, let, let's say Hillary Clinton wins the wins the, Let's just say <laughs> in 2018 midterm elections, it's going to be a, if we don't change what we're doing. And I have a suggestion. If we don't change. 2018 is going to be a repeat of 2010 in the sense that. Every Republican runs as a Tea Party guy because Hillary is so ter- terrible. Look at what she's taking over this industry, doing that with the terrorists. And, you know, Republicans will sweep in Congress, but you'll be left with the same infrastructure, the same leadership, the same clowns, and it's all rhetoric. And they're not going, they don't really believe it in, or they're not going to fight for it because our primary system is geared towards. Um, electing those with the most name recognition and most money who all campaign as conservatives so the real good guys can never get through because they get drowned out and the other guys aren't honest about who they are. That is something we need to solve. Otherwise, we're going to keep repeating the circuitous cycle. I, I, I agree with you, but I think the component that might be missing, and by the way, in 2010, I was heavily involved in the Tea Party and, and, and chaired one of the local Tea Parties, and, and had the parade of those candidates, both state and federal, come through our little our little meetings. And remember the bravada and the red meat that they threw out on the floor and everyone loved it and clapped like penguins. And, of course, none of it took place. But the missing element to me, I believe, is that when they get to Lansing, our state capital, or when they get to Washington, D.C., the caucus takes them under their wing and says, sit down. Here's the things that you never knew. And we're going to raise you up above the unwashed masses or the flyover people or whatever we want to label them today. You didn't know all of these facts. And I tell you that I was a candidate in 2006, had the opportunity of going to Lansing where they introduced us to this would be your support staff should you win. And it was a parade of people. I don't mean four or five staffers. I mean a parade of CPAs and accountants and especially a band of lawyers. (laughs) Wait a minute. This is this is not at all what the founders had in mind, um, and in fact, it, w- it led me to walk away believing that our elected officials are actually not the people in control, anyways. But one thing is for certain: in 2010, I saw very qualified, good people that I would identify as patriots that I know personally go into that system. And by the way, they're very different now. I don't know what happened to them, but I don't know them anymore. And that's something I think we need to find a way to equate, to measure, and expose. You know, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I've had the fortunate, unfortunate reality of dealing with this on both sides. Um, as you know, I ran a PAC. I helped recruit candidates. I recruited against Mitch McConnell and, and uh, Thad Cochran and some House members. I was involved with um, Dave Bratt. And what I found was by following both the electoral side and the legislative side so closely, I would see them coming in before as private citizens. I would see them then. And the problem we always had with these individuals is that, A, there's not enough of them. So we're not winning. We basically knock off one House incumbent on average per cycle, zero Senate incumbents per cycle, and win three to five to seven open House seats. It's not enough. So you have a handful of decent guys with good intuition coming in to a cesspool. 
Um, half of them get picked off right away because they just feel so isolated. They point to Louis Gohmert and say, do you want to be like him? Oh, no, 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 I don't want to be marginalized. <laughs> I want to, the, the line is, I want to be, um, I want to be productive. Right. And I want to be, I want to accomplish something. And the reality is, you know, you always see I put out these lists of top 10 winning political things we can be doing, we should be doing. But, you know, they block all that. They are not going to allow a a, a vote on reforming the refugee system. They're just not. Republican leadership will not do it. So you're stuck with – they say no to everything we want to do. And they run the agenda. And you're like, man, I can't always say no. I just, you know. Sure, and then you start. It's it's kind of the ten stages of grief. You start convincing yourself that you're <laughs> making a difference incrementally. Sure. Um, and 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 I I understand it. And that's the thing. I actually understand kind of where it comes from. The other big problem is staff. Um, it's very hard to find good staff. Um, I I will tell you one of my favorite members who I know gets it. His legislative director. When I was speaking to him about this. Uh, countering violent extremism bill they passed, the Muslim Brotherhood agenda, he didn't get what it was. Right. He totally didn't understand what the problem with it was. And and, and this this is one of the most conservative members. There is a dearth of good staff. So, but, you, but, Daniel, um, but Daniel, you talked about a vehicle or lack thereof. What do you have in mind? Get, we, we use a primary system now. I get that you're not necessarily thrilled with it. So what, what's the other alternative? You know, our system of government governance was supposed to be divided into three branches of federal government and then, you know, federalism divided between the states and the feds. That has fallen apart, right? Let's face it. That's been replaced for party politics. So instead of a legislature checking, you know, the runaway judiciary and executive branch, it's just a reiteration of the political divide between the parties. I mean, that's why you don't have the legislature standing up for its turf because there is no legislature. It's Republicans and, and Democrats. So my point is, now that po- party politics dominates everything, well, at least we need a party. Right? Right. We, we have a Democrat party that fights pedal to the metal for their things. We need, we need men on the field. How do we, How get, do we them? get men on the field? Right. How do we get men on the field? That's this, my question. Is this where Trump – This everything you've said today tells me why Trump's winning. He's the general that people are looking for to lead the charge. Is that what you basically say in a summary? Well, I mean, again, so the the thing is he has – everyone's sick of people that are conservative in the abstract but then don't do anything. Right. So the – and this guy is a guy who doesn't care and is going to do something. Now, the problem is – so you got the vehicle, but let's let's not forget populism is not the end goal. It might be a vehicle you could harness. You know, constitutional conservatism is – you know, he, he is kind of all over the place on things, and, you know, <laughs> time will tell. Um, you know, and, and he certainly is not being a leader – in terms of grooming, you know, endorsing good candidates. In fact, he, he endorsed one of the worst uh, open borders uh, congressmen, Renee Elmers. Luckily, she lost. I mean, he's been a little lost on there, and that's my point. We, it's not just one guy. We need an army, and I believe I have a whole article on this explaining the history behind switching to from state convention to um, – direct primaries our our founders envision representative democracy i look nothing's perfect but i think there I, I have concluded from recruiting candidates i just had a amazing guy afghanistan veteran challenged the worst of the worst incumbents in oklahoma last night he lost 60 40 he put in 70,000 of his own money 30 year old west point graduate young guy flushed his entire fortune into it um, but it wasn't enough we cannot win popular vote primaries because the other guys have the money, name ID to run, and they run as conservatives. <laughs> so your average person doesn't know. Whereas when you go to these state conventions, it's not perfect. It depends on the strength of the activist base in each state. Some are stronger than others. But the members tell me these guys come up with them with their Heritage Action scores, their conservative review scores. They get it. They know who these people are. Um, if some of these incumbents had to stand before these conventions, we'd have a better success rate. Da- than Daniel, I, Daniel, I have to tell you, um, I've, I've been on both sides. I've been a primary challenger. I've been a candidate in an open primary. And I'm also the second congressional district chair for the Republican Party here in the state of Michigan. And when I tell you that last part, it's to tell you that I'm very... We lost somebody. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> all okay. right, all right. Now I know what's going on. Okay. Is everybody still with me? Miles? We should have Miles now. Yeah. Okay. I got uh, cut off. Okay, okay, wonderful. Well, everyone's back. 
the the part where I'm where I'm telling you I'm second district chair. The point of me saying that is that I've been involved in a lot of conventions, and in the great state of Michigan, irony being what it is, Democrat or Republican, the average citizen has no clue, no concept whatsoever of how we nominate our candidates for attorney general or for lieutenant general or for secretary of state. It's done in convention. And what I've seen over the last 15 years in state convention is a lot of money, not necessarily a lot of ideology, but a lot of money. There are a handful of families that are very, very good at dominating and marketing inside the convention, and they push their candidate. Has nothing to do with ideology, has everything to do with checkbook. And so, listen, I was there was a point in my time a decade ago where I was on your team. I was very much saying the folks that know ought to be the ones that decide. And then I saw what happens in convention and went, um, wait a minute, let me pull back from that a little bit. So well, I, I'm agreeing with one thing, that there is no perfect system, but I'm not at all convinced that that's the right one, having been as involved in it as I have been. So let me just clarify what, what I'm referring to. Okay. I'm not referring, I'm referring to a Utah-style model. And, you know, what, what our, our founders were true moderates. In other words, the moderation between d direct democracy, direct popular vote on the one hand, and oligarchy on the other hand, you get tyranny either way. Like, and you're describing that. That's more of an oligarchy where the people have no recourse, have no input. In Utah, every neighborhood gets together. They have precinct meetings, every neighborhood. Um, it's very down-to-the-ground grassroots. It's, it's not you know 20 guys in a smoke-filled room. You elect a representative, and there's 4,000 of them. And Utah is a pretty small state. That's a lot. 4,000 go to the state convention. They're all That's elected by the neighborhoods. And, we, and we, in Michigan, we have precinct delegates. Both, par both major parties, at least, precinct delegates are elected on a, on a precinct level. So most townships will have three, four, five, as, as many as seven, depending on the popular, uh, precinct delegates. Those delegates can then go to their party of choice county conventions and decide on who amongst them will go on to the next step of being state uh, state um, state convention delegates. And in fact, I, I chair the caucus when we decided who would be our national delegates uh, from this district, at least, to go to Cleveland. And it's done exactly as you've just described. But within the halls of the state convention, it's still who has a checkbook, who knows how to whip the system, because whipping votes in a, in a state convention is a horse of a different color. I've watched it. I've been a part of it. It ain't. <laughs> it's it's oh. it's the epitome of ugly sausage making. And, and I watch people at these conventions uh, be, go come unglued and become putty in effect, elected officials' hands. Like, oh my gosh, there's so and so. Oh, I'm gonna do whatever they want. When the whole time well, I, on the way there, they were talking how they were completely against that person, <laughs> and I would never go that direction. I'm hardcore libertarian, Tea Party, or all the way. And then they <laughs> see that person, they're like, oh, okay, I'll vote for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, in Utah, I mean, there has been only one incumbent Republican senator to have gone down the primary from the right, from a challenge from the right in modern history. One time. I mean, that's how that's how rare it is. Oh, and I'm sorry, and has gone on to win a general election, you know, because there were other times like in Indiana and, you know, Joe Miller and Alaska, but they were so weakened because of how hard it is that they couldn't win the general um, and that's Mike Lee. Mike Lee was able to win because of that um, convention. A House guy also went down. That's how Jason Chaffetz originally got in there. Now he's kind of gone south on us. But the point is, you have a pretty lousy delegation there in the House. I can guarantee you, you will never defeat any one of them in a popular primary. That is for sure difficult. Um, you know, this way you could have the grassroots. You could whip. Um, there is such a bar to entry in order to raise enough money and name ID to win statewide or district wide. It just doesn't work. I blame so the, I not, blame I blame that on the electorate. But I got to tell you, what I'm what I'm kind of hearing you say, and you and we're almost out of time here, so so I'm 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 going to let you tell me how wrong I am. But my my ideology calls on me to win in the arena of ideas. The reason we do this radio show, Miles Bauer, the reason he's on. Ludwig von Wiedemdorski, the reason we're doing this show is to win in the arena of ideas. And so my pushback a little bit, Daniel, respectfully, is that for me to say, let's embrace the way that discounts the ideas, let's just give up on the electorate because that doesn't work. 
That's the same as saying our ideas aren't as good, so let's find a way to foil them. I'm not interested in foiling them. I want to beat them in the arena sure. of ideas. And I think we need to do an all of the above. And I'm going to have in my July 4th post many, many different suggestions. It's, it's all of the above. And you find this with Nigel Farage. You know, this was a 20-year battle, battle of ideas. And that, that's a great example of that. But what I'm saying here is ultimately you also need a vehicle. And, and what I'm proposing is not radical. Primaries are radical. Primaries came about, and I go through the history. It was Teddy Roosevelt and the progressives. Right. It is one of one political scientist calls it one of the um, one of the uh, uh, everlasting legacies of the prog- progressive movement. On net, we will be so much better off in almost every state by moving towards a representative process rather than pure democracy. I've, I've been on too many primaries. You cannot win. You, the, the, the proof is in the pudding. Sure. We don't knock off incumbents. It doesn't happen. Right. It, yeah. it, it's one, you know, one House guy per cycle or even every other cycle, one Senate guy per generation. We can't get there quick enough. Um, that, that's what I'm saying. The more you make it about this, the less money matters in a large scale. Sure, you could bribe people, sure. but I'm talking about you need millions prima facie to get on air. To even people don't vote it unless they know the guy. No, no, um, no question about. It. Daniel, I've got to yeah. stop you because we're out of. In fact, we're over time. Do me a favor though. Take a second. Tell folks how to get on your email list or how to find you. Sure. Well, you're on the privileged email list. Uh, I, I still don't have uh, the full system up, but if you subscribe at conservativereview.com, we are going to have a robust email system up, not just about the articles, but votes. Whenever votes take place, we w- will break them down within a couple hours. What happened? Why was significant? So, you know, knowledge is power. Like you're saying, we need to change hearts and minds. And, and that at its core is really what we're doing at Conservative Review. So it's kind of a one stop shop everything you need to know about what's going on in Washington. Daniel Horowitz, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. We will have you on as this election rolls out. Folks, we'll be right back with the Enigma Report. This is the Mike Hewitt Show on News Talk 1090 WKBZ and West Michigan's Talk 1230 WTKG. Renegade River, guns and ammo, and so much more. Old-fashioned service with surprisingly low prices. On M104 at the top of the new 231 bypass in Nutica. Or find us at renegaderiver.com. Because you deserve it. And the Mike Hewitt Show is brought to you by renegaderiver.com. You have arrived to your final destination on your journey through reality. Welcome to the Enigma Report. That was kind of a marriage between both ideas, I think. Yeah. I think I'm okay with that. What do you think, Miles? What's that? <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny. The, the intro that we just listened to was a marriage between... Both you know, uh, both concepts. If he's listening on the radio, Mike, he and it's iHeart. Yep. He's at least thirty seconds behind us. Oh, he's not doing that. So <laughs> no, he probably didn't even hear that. No, he's not doing no. that. He may have the uh, he may have had the music bed mixing with it, so he might have been hearing uh, two things at once. But uh, no, be. he's not on a delay. He's getting us in real time. Yeah, he's, if he's on the yeah. phone, right? Yeah, he's okay. on the phone. Yeah, yeah okay. he's real. Oh yeah. Okay. yeah. That was thirty seconds would give him way too much time to think. Don't yeah. ever let him have that much time. He'll tear you up, I'm telling you. <laughs> That'd be you. an enigma in itself. I'm telling you, it's terrible. Listen, the folks, what the Enigma Report today is about is kind of what we were talking about with Daniel Horowitz, and that is, is the problem the electorate or leadership? And I, and I say it that way because there's a... In fact, we've touched on this a couple different times in the last few weeks, but there's a lot of pushback back and forth within the grassroots on the conservative side, and I'm going to guess that the liberals are having their own push and pull right now also. But certainly on our side of the fence, there are folks that I have a lot of respect for that disagree with me entirely on this within the Michigan grassroots. I don't think that Miles and I are exactly in lockstep, and I'm going to guess from from Ludwig's past experience, he probably agrees with both positions. So right? Yeah, I wear flip-flops. Oh, yeah, he's flip-flopper. Oh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's the, the Trump Cruise supporter. Yeah. So he's, he, 
He's on the train and the cruise. He's there. Yeah. <laughs> if not by land, by sea, by air. Oh, yeah, he's going to get there somehow. <laughs> Listen, though, what, 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 for me, what the pushback is, is what really what Daniel Horowitz was talking about and what I, what I re, you know, um, shared with him, and I've certainly talked about it in the past, is that the electorate doesn't vote the way they live. And I find that just fascinating. I really do. It's scary fascinating. That's not a positive statement. But it goes to the example that I have often given, where we looked at the top five issues in the, in the electorate, the constituency within that district, overwhelmingly disagreed with that state rep the representative, and then overwhelmingly sent that state representative back to the Capitol. And you stand back and you go, wait, this was a primary. So Daniel Horowitz's point was, was that primaries don't work. Now, he was kind of saying the same thing I've been saying. I just don't like his solution. And I, respectfully, I, I think I think a lot of them. But I, I believe we've got to win in the arena of ideas. But, Miles, what say you? Well, so, you know, I think there's probably plenty of blame to go both to the leadership as well as to the uh, people. On the people side, I certainly agree. You know, there are those folks that only pay attention to politics when it's a presidential year and if it's in the month of October prior to voting. Right. And then there, you know, then there are the people like me that wake up every morning and I'm scanning through everything, right? But to temper that a bit, and I think we touched on it on the earlier segments, you know, so I have in the past gone out, listened to folks. They're saying all the right things. They lay out the red red meat, and then they head off to Washington and they – just send home excuses as to the reason why nothing can uh, get get uh, done. So it creates a sense of frustration for the folks like us who sit here and pay attention. Here, but here's go, well, my, then why, why did I even do that? But, Miles, here's my pushback. A lot of times we'll hear on the right side, and I'm guessing on the left I don't know, but certainly certainly in my little world I'll hear a lot of folks say that that elected is only doing that to get reelected. And I pause and I think about that for a minute. And I try to work that out. If that's true, that must be what the elected, the electorate wants that elected person to do. Now I look at it and say, wow, you just increased government by tenfold. Nice job. And my constituent, my folks, the people on my side will say, well, he or she only did that to get reelected. So they just spent a billion dollars and that helps them get reelected? And the answer is yes, which that's makes me pause <laughs> and say, are we that wrong? That having a monolith size, overwhelming government, maybe that's a good thing because the electorate seems to like it because they vote for the folks that do it, even though they then live conservatively and they can't magically put money in their check. Well, they can nowadays with welfare and Obama, but most folks can't magically put money in their checking account if it isn't there. They can't bust open a monopoly table and say, I'm going to use all this cash today. So they're, they they live differently than what they vote for. And I honestly don't get that disconnect. People think that it can't happen to them. And then I look at conservative talk radio, by the way. I do, because it's measure for me. I look at progressive radio. Conservative radio, like we're doing, overwhelmingly dominates radio for talk radio. And so, okay, so there must be a lot of folks that are trying to learn, trying to hear, trying to share some values with like-minded people that's not as true on the progressive side. I, I'm, I'm honestly, to me, it's an enigma. I don't get it. If I'm, uh, there's a guy that's one of, one of the leaders in Lansing, and nobody in his district that I know of likes him. I go, how'd that happen? Well, he got a 70-plus re-election in the, in the general. I go, no kidding. How'd that happen? <laughs> Honest, I don't get it. And I'm not bashing him. I'm not bashing them. I don't get it. People don't. don't think it'll happen to them. Well, but they're not paying attention to what's already happened to them. Well, yeah, they, what I'm saying is they don't think it'll happen to them. So when they vote for it, they don't think it's happening to them because it the, can't happen to it them. Isn't even the, it's not even the frog effect. We're talking about two-year or four-year terms. So if somebody goes out in a parking lot, sets your, phone, your car on fire, you notice it. You don't go, I think I'm going to vote for him again. I like the way you did that. I don't get it. Well, they don't think their car was set on fire. They think their neighbor's was. But when they can't have a car to drive no more, they must get it. Oh, it's not the election. When the fault. $19 toaster. That's the federal government's fault. The, they don't realize the importance the, of state government. When the government. $3 toaster costs $19 because the difference is filled with tax, somebody ought to get it. Miles, what am I missing? I don't, uh, 
I think there's one other feature that you've got to factor in in uh, to this as well because I spoke to a lot of folks. They don't go out and listen to news. They don't listen to news online. They just listen to social media, and they take that as factual news. And I I, I cannot tell you how many. Uh, times I've had to talk folks through that got some piece of information via social media. Now, I, obviously, this is a younger crowd than than you and I, but I mean, that's spooky as well when people begin to perceive reality through somebody they, else's opinion. They do. Listen, I still feel 20 inside, so forget that older stuff. But folks, we're <laughs> we're out of time. This time, I'm going to say it right. Find us on Twitter at Talk Mike Hewitt. Find us on Facebook, forward slash The Mike Hewitt Show and TheMikeHewittShow.com. By the way, we're looking for sponsors and we're looking for help on how to make this iPad pick up audio so we can stream right. If you got ideas, give me a shout. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Ludwig. And thank you, Brian. <laughs>